Hi, gang. Bob Bovin here with The Mystery Project and the next episode of Peggy Delaney, written by James W. Nickel. When a doctor is accused of misconduct with female patients, he appeals to Peggy for help. She finds it a harrowing and deeply troubling investigation. The Muskoka Point Hotel, starring Kyra Harper as Peggy Delaney. Hello there. You've reached Peggy Delaney, Toronto Tribune. If you have something confidential you want to pass on, just leave your name and number. The walls have ears. I'll get back to you. If you're calling to give me fulsome, unqualified praise for my columns, please feel free. If you're calling to scream at me, fascist, communist, cop-loving, cop-hating, pro-lesbian, anti-lesbian, crypto Bay Street swamp pig, go for it. After all, this is a quasi-democracy. Doctor? Hi. Peggy Delaney. That's right. I think I'd have recognized you even if I wasn't expecting you. Oh? From your picture in the paper. It's really nice to meet you. Well, thanks. Uh, your nurse said I could come on through. Yes, of course. Please, sit down. Please. Okay. I'm uh, just filling in time, shuffling some files around. Thank you for seeing me, for being interested. Well, it's an interesting situation. I'm sure you've had more than just my request, though. You're the only one I trust to be objective. I, I read your column, you see, and I agree with your take on the world most of the time. All these other media types, you can see them, their agendas coming from a mile away. Oh, is that right? I'm not suggesting, of course, you'll write what you write. I mean... Okay. So, your license to practice has been suspended by the College of Physicians and Surgeons pending further investigation. Is that correct? Mm, yes. And they gave you a chance to tell your side of the story? Yes, but obviously they weren't persuaded. So we're into it. Lawyers, a formal hearing, but God knows when. And now the police are investigating to see if criminal charges should be laid. Hmm. It's every doctor's nightmare. Mm-hmm. Well, welcome to mine. Uh, I don't know how you can do that. What? Smoke and eat a Caesar salad at the same time. Oh, it's not that difficult. But thanks. So what do you think of my doctor? How many women did you say? Two, so far. Mm. There was a third one when he was practicing in Winnipeg. But then, when they looked into her complaint at the time, it turned out she had accused her dentist and optometrist and the man next door of the same thing. How old is he? Mm, younger than we are. <gasps> is that possible? <laughs> He's 37. But he looks 20. That kind of face. Round and handsome and soft and, you know, lovely big brown eyes. Naturally curly hair. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I can see him now. Uh, the sweetheart, could you waft that smoke in a different direction? You're wilting my romaine here. This is a great idea, Bernie. What? Having lunch together. Well, well how else am I going to get to see you? You've been avoiding me. No, I haven't. I've just been really busy. Yeah. Yeah, that's what Amber says. Well... Actually, the word she used was squirrely. Squirrely? Mm. Where'd she dig that up? I'm not squirrely. I have three columns to write each week, every week. You should try it sometime. Both of you. She says you're up half the night. She hears you. Look, I know where this is leading, so stop it. I'm off the stuff. I haven't had a drink in weeks. I'm fine, really. You know what'll drive me crazy? People hovering around me, watching me. That's what'll drive me crazy. I gave Amber my word. I know. And I'm keeping it. I thought we were having lunch. We are. Good. So hurry up, will you? I have to meet these two women. At the same time? No, separately. I think I'm going to hate them. Why? Oh, I don't know. It just drives me nuts. I mean, they're grown women. They have an affair with their doctor. They go to his apartment, hotels, and now, suddenly, they were powerless. They were taken advantage of. They were victims. They've been emotionally scarred and irrevocably, psychologically damaged. It's like saying women are so naive, so innocent, so 
obtuse. They shouldn't be let outside without a keeper. It's like saying there's something inherently weak-minded about us. It's Victorian. It's demeaning. It's not true to life as we know it on this planet. And it's infuriating. Should be an interesting afternoon. Just leave the word victim to real victims. Don't debase it all the time. Okay. Well, look, this has been great, Bernie. But I've got to go. You've only been here 25 minutes. Sorry, it's just... I know, I know, I know. Uh, Busy. Uh, Look, uh, sweetheart, um, I just wanted to say... um, I just wanted... uh, Amber is such a terrific kid. Yes, she is. Why? Well... She's she's so pleased you're off to sauce. It's kind of heartbreaking in a way, you know, and and she's worried at the same time. She hears you walking around the apartment half the night, pacing around. I, I don't know. Working. Sure, 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 working. Look, how long have we been best friends? Forever, right? I know this guy. He's a terrific guy, and he, uh, he swears by AA. Now, listen, listen to me, listen to me. It's really helped him out. It continues to... Well, he, he says he'd really be pleased to take you along to a meeting. Just go at your own speed, just hang out, talk to some people, hear some other people's stories, please. Sweetheart, just get some support. Don't try to do this all by yourself. I've seen you try this on your own before. Give yourself a break this time. Give Amber a break. Uh Uh-huh. Well, one, I was going to split the bill. But since you had this secret agenda, you can pay for it. Okay. And two, it's exactly because of Amber, because I gave her my word. That's why I can do it this time. Oh, yeah? And three, go to hell. More tea? Um, no thanks. I'm swimming. Another piece of cake? Mm, No thanks. My mother-in-law made it. She's a really good cook. Well, so she's obviously on your side uh, in all this. I mean, there hasn't been an estrangement? No. Well, whatever my husband says, her son, and he certainly understands. He's been very understanding. And she's an Italian mother, so... But uh, I see her looking at me. She hates me, actually. She doesn't understand the imbalance of power between a doctor and his patient? No. Dr. Westland's a GP, though, isn't he? He's not a psychiatrist or a counselor of some kind. But nevertheless, you feel his power over you was considerable? Yes. Uh, He might as well have been a a counselor or whatever. He was treating me for depression. We talked about very intimate things. Uh Uh-huh. Lots of things. Private. You build up trust. You become very vulnerable. So you first went to him? I was referred to him and by a friend. Ah. I'd been diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome. But I, I wasn't happy with the, the vagueness of the diagnosis or the treatment. So I thought I'd try another doctor. He spent a great deal of time with me. An inordinate amount. I should have been suspicious. But that's the kind of doctor he wanted to be. Or so he said. Available to the person behind the ailment, not just a traffic cop for specialists, and a dispenser of pills, so he said. And so you became dependent on him? Yes. I was so unhappy, so mixed up about everything. I cried a lot. He'd pat my hands, hold them. And then, after the first few visits... He'd hold me, hug me, you know. Hmm. It was so reassuring. I was like this little kid. I poured my heart out to him. And 
He got so I had to see him all the time. I was so happy to see him. So I, I was getting better, you see. He was making me better. He said I was just weighed down by loneliness, that I'd never been unreservedly, absolutely loved. Well, I told him as much, hadn't I? So that's what he offered. In those words? No. I just knew at this one moment in his office that that was what he was offering. I was a fool. But I was totally lost by this time. I didn't know who I was, what I was. He was uh, stroking my face, and I turned and kissed his hand. Like a frightened little kid might. I must have had a look of absolute terror on my face. And uh, we held each other, and... Once we started our relationship, I was like this person I'd made up. I was powerless over her. If he'd said, jump off the CN Tower, I'm sure she would have. How long did it go on? Almost a year. I broke down. I had to be hospitalized. And it was then I told my husband. I felt so awful, so guilty. And your husband? He understood that uh, some crime had been committed, some crime against me. I understand it was his idea to go to the Ontario Medical Association uh, and the police. At first? Yes. Sure you don't want a beer? Yeah. Anything? I've got some really terrible wine. No, thanks. So, uh, getting back to where we were. Yeah. Well, it's a pattern, right? As soon as my lawyer discovered this other woman and her husband had filed a complaint, it became very obvious this was not a one-time thing. I mean, with me. You went to him because of stomach pains. Right. I work in this industrial lab. We try to be careful, but God knows what we accidentally breathe in or absorb through our skin. The pain wouldn't go away. I was concerned. I always think the worst, cancer. Mm. He thought possibly the beginnings of an ulcer. What was it? An ulcer. Mm. He's a funny guy, you know. I mean, amusing. He can be very amusing. Charm your socks off. Or, in my case, everything. <laughs> Well, you seem to be in pretty good spirits. I am, now. You learn. Do you ever learn? How did that thing start? Talking. Talking? You went there for stomach pains. But I ended up talking. He likes to talk. All about my life, you know? Montreal, all my disastrous relationships. And how did you get on that subject? He just leads. Little harmless questions. The softest, warmest voice... I just found him very simpatico, you know. I was feeling completely messed up at the time. And his hands, when I was lying down, when he was examining my tummy. Was his nurse there? Yes, she was there, whenever he examined me. But it didn't matter. My neck still tingled. The way his fingers would press down, run over my skin. Was this all your imagination? Or it's something he knew he was doing. At first, I thought it was just me. It was embarrassing. But when I came back for follow-ups, the message was very definitely there. Then why did you go back? I went back because I was lonely as hell. I'd just moved here. I'd had to literally get out of Montreal because of this abusive boyfriend. I didn't know anyone here. He, Alan... My doctor was someone to talk to. Someone who really cared, I thought. About the fourth time I was there, I was sitting on the edge of the examination table, talking to him, and I got crying. And he held me. 
and it was just extraordinary. He held me, and it was electric. He said he was falling in love with me. Can you tell me how much happened in his office? Uh, because that's important, I mean, isn't it? Everything happened in his office. He'd examine me. Then his nurse would go back to the reception room so we'd be alone. Who touched who first, in a sexual way, if you don't mind me asking? He did. That same time, when he told you he was in love with you? No, he was too smart. He just moved away, said I should go. He looked so sad, upset. So I did, kind of walked out like a zombie. I waited for him to call. He didn't. I went back. When he examined me, that time, in front of his nurse, I was shivering. When she left, he touched my face, ran his thumb across my lips, kissed me. We set a record, I think, for getting our clothes off. With the door ajar? Yes. And now you feel it was an unfair relationship. Because he was a doctor and you were his patient. He had all the power. He could ask you personal questions and you'd confide in him because he was your doctor. He could touch you because that was his job. He was your doctor. And when he knew me well enough that I was vulnerable and when I became dependent enough on him, then he made his move. He never loved you? Alan Westland is a sinister, calculating, sexual predator. That's all he is. Hi, Mom. Hi, honey. How's your day? Fine. Hi, Sammy. So, how's everything? Fine. I had lunch with Bernie. Did you? You didn't know? No. Why would I know? Just wondered. How is he? Oh, he's just busy being Bernie. Uh, you got a package delivered. Oh? Well, an envelope. Here. So, how was school? Mm, they handed out timetables today. Christmas exams. And then back to Vancouver. <sighs> mm-hmm. That's so depressing. Mom, how was the deal? I don't care. So what is it? It's, uh, oh, just a photostat of a bill from the Muskoka Point Hotel. For you? No, for Dr. Alan Westland. A weekend in August, 1996. And who sent it? Well, it doesn't say. Hey, that's the doctor who... Uh -huh. who and my first guess, since it's his, is that he sent it. Why? August 96. Rita Donato. She's the married one of those two women. She was still involved with him in August of 96. And the other one? Jill Athens? No. She came after. Just last year. Or, I mean, they weren't even concurrent. So how bad a guy is he? Well, I wouldn't want to go to a doctor and... I think he had other ideas than just being my doctor. That's creepy. Well, you're absolutely right. However, I think Jill thought she'd fallen into something pretty good. Love, maybe even marriage. They went out to clubs together. She stayed over at his place lots of nights. Then he dropped her. Do you think if he hadn't, if he'd said, let's get married, she'd be charging him? I don't think so. Well, how about the other one? Well, she says she was feeling particularly vulnerable, and he took advantage. But married people do have affairs, and half the time it's precisely because they are feeling vulnerable. But he was her doctor, so you're right. Creepy. But illegal? The Crown has to prove that Dr. Westland was exercising some sort of extraordinary authority or power over his patients that these relationships couldn't be characterized as consensual, well, in order to establish criminal behavior. That's why this invoice is so interesting. Why? 
Well, just how passive were these women? No, I appreciate you taking the time to come over here. Business is going crazy. I just can't seem to get away. Well, I wanted to meet you too, Mr. Donato. Since you're the driving force behind your wife's case. I think Jill Athens is pursuing it just as vigorously. This is about criminal behavior. This is about a guy who stalks women and controls them. I'm not even convinced there wasn't hypnotic suggestion involved. And then uses them. With no more concern than, than blowing his nose on a piece of Kleenex. Danny. The point is... My wife wouldn't have spent five minutes with this guy if he hadn't had complete control over her. So, there's your proof right there. Well, uh, thanks, Mr. Benito. That's all right. Uh, let's move towards the front door a little. Just wanted to make sure you understood our side of things. Rita, sometimes she feels things, thinks them, but doesn't say them. Well, I just get everything right out on the table. Right, Rita? Yes. Uh-huh. Well, looks like the real estate business is booming. It's coming back. Why? Are you in the market? No, I just rent. I like my apartment. Throwing your money down a big black hole. Well, I almost did invest in real estate one time. This friend, he was a partner in this hotel uh, up in Muskoka. Wanted me to invest or something. The Muskoka Point Hotel. No kidding. We used to go there, didn't we, Rita? Uh, did we? Sure. You remember. Years ago, when we were first engaged. Oh, right. Wait up! He told you, didn't he? I'm not sure. Probably. It would have come out in the hearing anyway, wouldn't it? He has to defend himself. Well, I was hoping, praying that he might have some shred of decency, that, that he might not. He's fighting for his reputation, his livelihood, and you're trying to send him to jail. I'm not. I just want the whole thing to go away. It's, it's Danny. It's his ego. Uh-huh. And the Muskoka Point Hotel? Obviously, this was your idea of a great place to spend the weekend. Uh, with Alan. This doesn't change what I'm saying. It doesn't change a thing. I was out of my mind. It changes the dynamics. Difficult to prove victimization when you're suggesting the resort to be victimized in, isn't it? Why, well, here she comes. The Toronto Trib's one-woman firestorm. Hi, Nick. Shut up, Nick, and leave me alone. Oh, I'm exhausted. I've never seen a more violent reaction to a column in all my career. I know. I've got feminist groups from Afghanistan after me. Really? No. I've got misogynist nut bars from England hailing me as the greatest thing since homogenized milk. Really? Yes. Not to mention a certain woman's husband who's threatened to break my neck if ever he sees me. Well, you love it. Yeah. And it makes me feel sick. I just wrote what I thought was going down. Yes, you did. And here she is, Peggy Delaney of the Toronto Tribune. What are you doing, Charlie? Running a tour? No, I'm just pointing out that you are here. And now I'm going to ask you what you would like. I would like a double gin poured gently over ice. But... I guess I'll have a ginger ale. Excellent choice. Oh, by the way, telephone call. How did you know I was here? Um, I told your office who I was, and they suggested I try this Blue Moon Saloon. Well, they're a helpful bunch. As rough as you were on me in your column, I just wanted to thank... Oh, no, don't thank me. I just didn't think what you did with those women added up to criminal behavior. Neither did the Crown. Did you hear? They're not going to proceed with charges. Yeah, I heard. I'm hoping it had to do with the facts of the case, not my column. I think it had a lot to do with the Muskoka Point Hotel. Uh-huh. You picked the right person to give that information to, didn't you? Picked me right out of a crowd. 
You're a clever guy. Well, better than springing it on her in a court of law and then letting all the newspapers run with it, don't you think? I don't know. I haven't asked her. And the college is still proceeding with my hearing, though. They're trying to prove that I'm a person, as their standards of practice puts it, of bad character. Can't help you there. Oh, well, that's only in Ontario. That's why I wanted to call you. Besides thanking you, I've accepted a position with a hospital in the States. I'm leaving. Tonight. Going to the States? Uh-huh. Did he say where? Of course not. Why did he call? Oh, he was crowing. I think he thinks he did me, too. No kidding. Having second thoughts. About what? Hurting people? That's what I get paid to do. Well, those women's names weren't printed in the paper, of course. His was. Yeah. It just didn't warrant a criminal charge. Unless you want to believe women lose all capacity to exercise their free will under the influence of an authoritative male. Personally, I don't. At the same time, I know, as well as I'm sitting here, that he's going to do the same thing wherever he goes. You have been listening to the Muskoka Point Hotel, the latest episode of Peggy Delaney by James W. Nickel. Kyra Harper played Peggy. Katerina Scorsoni played Amber. John Stalker played Bernie. William Colgate played Charlie. J.W. Carroll played Nick. With them were our featured guest performers, David Ferry as Dr. Alan Westland, Arlene Maserol as Rita, Gabrielle Jones as Jill, and Dom Fiore as Danny Donato. The music was composed and conducted by Milan Kimlicka. The recording engineer was Drago Grandic. Sound effects were by Matt Wilcott. Sandra Breitman was the associate producer. The program was produced and directed by Bill Howell, the executive producer of The Mystery Project. Our coordinating producer is Barry Morgan. Cassettes of this Peggy Delaney series are now available at all bookstores in your neighborhood, as well as your local library. I'm Bob Bolting. Thanking you for listening and inviting your comments. See you next week.